Good morning. I'm sorry that it's dark out here, but it's it's very, very early in the morning. And um, I wanted to make sure that I answered your question thoroughly. I'm actually in the process of letting the dogs out this morning. <clears throat> so just bear with me for the darkness. Okay, so um, as far as DCM and evaluating ingredients, right? So with the first part of your question about dog foods that undergo quote unquote feeding trials, it's important for you to research what a feeding trial is and what exactly is required in order to pass a feeding trial, right? For AFCO or Wasaba because a, a quote unquote feeding trial sounds like it would be significant, right? I mean, that would be the whole point, would be to test the food before it goes to market to ensure its safety, right? That makes perfect sense. <clears throat> so unfortunately, because dog food companies are so heavily involved in all of the quote unquote rulemaking for things like this, like these feeding trials, they really fall short of being thorough, unbiased, and helpful to consumers. So really what they address is a minimal liability coverage for companies. And let me explain. So when you have a feeding trial, um, and this was as of last year, I don't know if anything has changed for this year. It hasn't changed in many, many years. So my guess would be that it has not changed for this year. But as of last year, a feeding trial consisted of at least 10 dogs. And 60% of those dogs had to complete the feeding trial. Now, what does that mean, complete the feeding trial? Well, that means that based on the rules that they have created, that six out of 10 dogs have to survive, survive the feeding trial. Not that they thrive, not that they do well, not that they don't have allergic reactions or uh, lose weight or um, uh, even if four of the 10 die from eating the food, in order for them to be able to put that on the label, six out of 10 have to survive. And for those of us who are well-educated in scientific methods, that's not acceptable. It would never be acceptable by human standards, right? And it shouldn't be acceptable by dog standards. And that's why you end up with foods on the market like Purina Pro Plan that have wildly heavily reported manufacturing issues and wildly heavily reported health issues associated with the food. Most commonly that you could feed one bag one week and your dogs would be fine. And the next week, the dogs would all have explosive diarrhea. And I'm just using this one food as an example. There are many others that fall under the wasaba approved and I'm doing air quotes if you can't see me, foods that this happens, right? All of these brands, they have the same problems because they're being mass produced and there isn't that push for quality, right? So um, the other thing that you wanna be careful about using is terms like quote unquote boutique brands. That term came from the marketing department of those companies 
right that are trying to push you to get their food so don't don't use their their marketing terms they're not boutique brands right they're just brands of dog food that are not those big huge brands that you see that are listed as being part of wasaba approved by the way um i do have a couple of YouTube videos that I've talked about DCM at length. Um, I have two videos and then also I have one where I actually sit down and go over each of the requirements to be Wasaba approved. Um, spoiler alert, it, it, it doesn't make them special. It doesn't make them qualified as a good food. You can in fact have terrible ingredients that are not appropriate for canines and still be wasava approved. Because again, these are constructs that are created by the dog food industry. They're, they're not created by nutritional specialists or veterinary nutritionists who have done any research or tested anything. That's the other thing that a lot of people fall back on is they're like, oh, well, these, these brands are, they're research proven. I can start a research project today, um, get all kinds of funding to say that poodles are the best dogs in the world. Hands down, there should be no other dogs in the world other than poodles. And it, the research would provide a, a laundry list of reasons why that's the case. Now, you may not have poodles, and you may disagree with me, but my research is going to show that poodles are the best breed. And in actuality, there shouldn't be any other dogs in the world, only poodles. Well, how is that possible? Because I'm the one doing the research... I am the one who is biased to poodles. I want that research to show that poodles are the best. Therefore, I'm going to conduct it in such a way that that's what it shows. And, and that's why I say you have to take everything with a grain of salt. Even my advice. I, I am not the exception to giving dog food advice. And, and I am always very clear about that. I am one rather conservative view on how you as a pet parent can do best by your pets. It is 100% your responsibility to take what I say with a grain of salt and research it. Just as I would expect you to do from a vet, just as I would expect you to do from a pet food company, it, it's, it's on you. I am provided you with a lot of information, a lot of condensed information in my Facebook group. But it's your responsibility to take it the next step. And that next step is where you do the research and you make a decision on your own. And that's what's important. And that's what I encourage people to do. And that's where, in my opinion, pet food companies and vet nutritionists and uh, veterinarians fall short because they just tell you, they just regurgitate what's been told to them and they're not encouraging pet parents to be responsible for their pets and do their research. My view on pet food is conservative, right? Especially when it comes to DCM. I tell people, I do not approve foods for my recommendation list that contain legumes of any kind or potatoes of any kind. Why is that? Well, because the last veterinary nutritionist seminar that I attended, which was, I think the end of 2020 was the last one that they had, the last symposium on DCM specifically, um, they were talking about how the research is already showing that it can have an effect on puppies to have these ingredients in the food and for them to grow up with these ingredients and that they're already finding that they cannot reverse the effects. Now, 
Is the research completed? No, nothing is ever done quickly when it comes to dog food. Nothing is ever done quickly. So I take my conservative stance to protect others. And I've gotten a lot of flack for it, even from other nutritionists, both veterinary and canine. I've gotten a lot of flack for it because they fall back on, well, the research doesn't show blah, 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 blah. Listen, I used to work for dog food companies. I've been in the game. I know how this works. Nothing happens quickly. It might be another five years before the research comes out. And if it comes out unfavorably to large pet food companies specifically that are owned by um, huge conglomerates and candy companies, you better believe that they are gonna do everything in their power to lobby against it. So you have to take everything with a grain of salt, like I said. There are people who don't agree with my conservative position, and that's okay. The reason why I so loudly voice my conservative opinion about pet foods and ingredients and problematic ingredients is to encourage pet parents to do their research and to decide for themselves what is acceptable. For example, and this is a perfect example and I'll end here, there was recently a quote unquote pet nutritionist on TikTok that was recommending pet foods and going over ingredient lists. And people get very excited about this because they wanna learn and they wanna do what's best for their pet. Well, in the video, she makes a, um, some contradictory statements about whether or not it's a good food. So I commented on the video. Sorry, it cut me off because my alarm went off to tell me that, hey, it's time to get up. So the, um, so this quote unquote pet nutritionist, she made a lot of contradictory statements about whether or not it was a good food. And then in the comments stated that it's not a food that she would feed her own dogs, but that she provides these reviews and recommendations for others who may need to find a food in their budget. Now, for me personally, that is unacceptable, right? You cannot go, in my opinion, on a public forum under the guise of helping people and tell them, hey, I recommend this food. And then in the small print say, well, yeah, but actually I know better and I would never feed this to my dog. That's not fair to people because they're not gonna read the small print. Many of them are not going to see those comments and she actually ended up blocking me. So uh, they won't see my comments at all. But that's, that's where I hold myself to a different standard right? People have asked me why I have removed foods from my recommendation list that the brand itself had a recall, but not necessarily on that food. And I say to them, because I wouldn't feed it to my dog. I am not going to make any recommendation that I would not feed to my own dogs, right? Because that wouldn't be fair. It would, it's, not, it's not fair to walk onto the scene claiming to be an expert under the guise of helping others and then to make a recommendation and then in the small print say, oh, by the way, I wouldn't feed this to my dog. What? That's not helping anybody. And her defense was, well, you know, people need to be able to find something in their budget. And if you look at my recommendation list, there are plenty of options in various budget ranges. But you can't, you can't encourage pet parents to do better if you don't teach them how to do better. Anyway, I haven't had coffee yet, so I've gone off on a little bit of a tangent. 
So let me go back and check the question to make sure I answer, because I think it was a two-part question, so hang on. Okay, second part of the question is that um, people make claims that high-protein diets are not good for dogs because it's hard on their kidneys. And first off, let me start by saying that if you are feeding a kibble diet, it's hard on your dog's kidneys. Guys, of course now the dogs are gonna play right on top of me. Hang on. So, if anyone's going to claim that high protein equals bad for kidneys, then those same people should A, not feed kibble diets, and B, shouldn't recommend kibble diets, which is going to completely knock out their entire, entire argument. Now, that aside, let's talk about high protein or protein in general. This is a common misconception because pet food companies are challenged with making sure that there's enough protein in their high carb foods. Because in order to create kibble, you have to have a lot of carbs, um, way more than a dog would ever need, unless they're a working dog working an eight hour day. So in order to ensure that the food is essentially not cattle food and just all starches and grains, they have to meet certain requirements for protein. And I can tell you as a canine nutritionist who has created many, many, many recipes that ensuring that the food has enough protein without utilizing legumes, and other protein rich options, for example, soy, right? It can be challenging, especially if you're working under certain parameters, for example, limited ingredient or dog has an allergy, or in the case of pet food companies, they're trying to keep their costs down. So is high protein a problem? Well, let me ask you this. Dogs in the wild, right? And mostly in other countries, we see that they have wild dogs. Do we see them limiting their protein intake? Do we see them eating a lot of grains? Going out, do we hear stories of packs of dogs going out and raiding the cornfield? No, because dogs who are never exposed to eating kibble have no idea what it is. We as humans have taught them, weaned them from birth to say, hey, this little, you know, spherical brown cracker is food. Eat it. Right. We taught them to do that. They, they don't do it naturally. And it's actually very entertaining to watch. If you do um, some YouTube searches, you can find dogs who were never exposed to kibble given an option of a meat and a giant bowl of kibble. And they will go to the tiny piece of meat every time because they don't recognize it as food. It's like trying to feed lettuce to a, sa to a, um, a snake. And that's not my analogy, by the way. That little gem comes from Dr. Karen Becker. And I, I thought it was genius trying to feed lettuce to a snake. It's not species appropriate, right? They don't recognize it as food. So can foods that are unbalanced be a problem? Yes. If a dog ate only protein and nothing else. Nothing that had any calcium in it, nothing that had any fiber in it. Would that be problematic? It could be. Dogs who have lived their whole lives on kibble 
and are then given an option of fresh food with higher protein, do their bodies need to adjust? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but it doesn't mean that they can't thrive on it. It doesn't mean that high protein is a problem. And in many cases, if you look at the labels, foods that claim to be high protein are really not. They're really mostly carbs or those that are higher in protein. Um, you know, the protein is coming from legumes. That's, that's not helpful to a dog. So, you know, can dogs have issues if they're fed an imbalanced diet that's high in protein? Yes. High velocity. You're a good girl. <laughs> but it, it can happen the other way around too. It can happen that um, diets high in fat can cause pancre acute pancreatitis. Right? But you don't see anybody running around going, oh no, this diet's high in fat. There's gonna, dogs are going to have problems. Right? So, again, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Pet food companies are trying to, um, you know, reduce the cost to create the food. Keep costs low. Right? That's just good business, business practice while still meeting the minimum requirements. And you'll see that many times on a bag, it'll say, oh, this is a high protein food. And then you flip it over and on the back it says, minimum a certain percentage, maximum a certain percentage. Well, how much protein does that food have? That bag right there in front of you, how much protein does it have? You don't know. And there would be no way for you to know unless you took a sample of the food and sent it off to a lab. So we are trying to navigate a system that is designed to work against the consumer, designed to assist companies creating pet foods and is muddied with biased research, incomplete data, and massive misinformation. And it's challenging. It's, it's hard to do. So you just have to do the best that you can. And you have to remember that um, while dogs are not obligate carnivores, they, they are opportunistic carnivores. And if given a choice, they will eat meat, bone, organs, some stomach content, you know, for fiber and things like that. They're, they're not like cats. They're not obligate carnivores. Cats don't need any grains at all should never have grains at all which is why if you look in my group under my cat food recommendations you will not find one kibble and you will actually find an entire paragraph about why cats should never ever be fed kibble under any circumstances ever never ever ever zero exceptions dogs eh they they are resilient animals. They can, they can really take a beating. You can feed them high carb for many, many years before they start having problems. But by the time they start having problems, it's too late. So, okay. I've rambled on enough this morning. I hope you have a great day. And we'll see you in the next video.